Okay, that's it. I told you two weeks ago. No more comedy. I need to get on with the show. We have important things to do here. Can't you get that into your craw? You got to be kidding me. No, I'm not kidding you. Just say what I asked you to say and everything will be fine. You know something? You're no Bill after. I'm not looking for opinion. I just want an introduction. Can you do it, please? You. It's the Outdated Wrestling Hour. and welcome back once again to the Outdated Wrestling Hour. My name's Bob Smith, the old PWI guy. We're glad to have you back. We're going to have an entire show about the American Wrestling Association. That's right. Vern Gagne's AWA. Nick Bockwinkle, Ray Stevens, Pat Patterson, Vern Gagne, Greg Gagne, Bruiser Brody, Crusher Blackwell, Sheik Adnan LKC, Ken Patera, the Vashon Brothers, Kenny J, the Sodbuster, Billy Robinson, the Midnight Rockers, Doug Summers and Buddy Rose, managed by Sherry Martell, Kurt Hennig, Larry Hennig, Harley Race, and on and on and on. Some of the greatest wrestlers of all time pass through Minnesota, and I think they get a bum rap. I really do. I think they're not looked upon as favorably in wrestling history as they should be, particularly the ESPN years, the most underrated TV program, voted worst TV program by the Wrestling Observer for years. I don't care. I liked it better than virtually everything else that was on the air. I never missed an episode. Our guest today is someone who is equally as fond of the AWO as I was. So let's meet him and find out exactly why. Okay, this is one of those shows I've been setting up for a long time, and I'm really excited for this one. It's a fellow you may not have heard of, but you're going to like what you hear when you meet Michael Morris from Pennsylvania. Welcome to the show. Hi, Bob. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm telling you, you guys, um, I was talking about the AWA in the intro, and we're going to talk a lot about that. But first, we're going to talk about the fact that I am mutual friends with Michael of Bill Apter and Craig Peters. How did you get to know these guys? Uh, this is this is going to be a story, Bob. Uh, All right. Um, and I got to start back at the beginning. And I if if I get go too far off course, you know, give me the nod or something. But um, <laughs> when I was a kid growing up in uh, central Illinois, just outside of Peoria, Illinois, I used to ride my bike into a little place called Maury's Caramel Corn. And Maury's <laughs> was a three, it was a three store front uh, thing in d- downtown in our, our town, three buildings. Only the center door was open. And when you walked into Maury's, you could smell the caramel corn. And that center section had all magazines in it. One of the, another section had candy, and then a third section had just like a romance novels, paperback books. Hmm. But the wrestling magazines were, you walked directly in the front door, you could stand right near the caramel corn machine and, and look at wrestling magazines. And I, w- I, had, I had watched a little of the AWA wrestling on TV, but I wasn't really into it until I started to look at the magazines because I didn't realize there was a whole big world out there of other territories of wrestling. I only knew what I could see on our local television long before cable. So, you know, if your local television had a wrestling show, then you could, that was the territory that you watched. And we happened to get AWA out of Minneapolis. So I was, that's all I was familiar with. I started reading the magazines and it was absolutely fascinating, Bob, this whole the, the mm-hmm. magazines, which we now know are called after magazines. I didn't know that at the time mm-hmm. as a kid. But I recognized the name Bill After because he wanted to write or he, he, he wrote a lot of the stories. Right. And I was fascinated by his writing. And I wanted to be Bill After. At age 14, I wanted to be, I wanted to write for the wrestling magazine. And with it was with that in mind, and I 
I, I got to an age, I got to maybe 16 and, and some buddies and I, we would travel. Uh, they would come every month to Richwoods High School in Peoria, Illinois, the AWA for the shows. So we started attending the shows. I've continued to read the magazines. And in the fall of 1975, my junior year in high school, I took my first journalism course in high school. Absolutely fell in love with it. And so then I had, I had a goal, you know, now, now I want to be a writer. I want to be a reporter. I want to be Bill after I want to write for the wrestling magazines. Everything was starting to fall into place for me there. And so I had the idea, I'll go down to my local newspaper. You know, you know, you grew up, uh, we all grew up with a local newspaper back then. My uh, first job. Every, yeah. Every town had a local newspaper. Ours mm -hmm. did too. And I did, I just walked in the door, asked for the sports editor, went back, told him what I wanted to do, what I was interested in. He said, yeah, sure. You can write for us. And he said, what do you want to write about? I said, I want to write about professional wrestling. He said, yeah, that's fine. You can, <laughs> uh, you can cover the matches in Peoria if you want. So, yes, that's exactly what I want. I would like wow. to do this very much. Nice. So he said, I'll tell you what, it was, there was a, you know, an upcoming card. And uh, he said, I'll set you up with a credential. I didn't even know what a credential was, a, a media credential. <laughs> He said, I'll, I'll arrange it. You just show up at the gymnasium, tell them who you are, who you're representing, and you're in. So of course, my first thought as a 16-year-old is, hey, I'm saving the three bucks that I got to pay to sit in the bleachers there. You know? <laughs> I'm getting it for nothing. This is great. <laughs> so I decided this is a big deal for me. I actually put on a tie and a jacket to go to the wrestling matches that night because I'm, I'm working. And... Sure enough, I get there and they, they know who I am and they, they start to take me through the paces. Now, Peoria is a big Caterpillar town. And back then, Caterpillar was the major industry in that town. Right. The tractors. And the tractors. Stuff, Caterpillar right. tractors. Right. Bulldozers, things like that. A fellow by the name of Ken Gerber, who worked in the public relations department at Caterpillar, was the ring announcer for the matches in Peoria. And once I get to the gym, of course, I get there early. Nobody's in there yet. You know, um, they introduce me to Ken and Ken proceeds to tell me, you know, what my, you know, what, what he would like to see me do that evening. He said, we're going to sit you at the ringside right next to, and I, I still, <laughs> the physician at ringside and the, and the timekeeper, we're going to sit you right there in a metal chair. Now, and you know this, Bob, this was before the days there were any railings between the first row and the ring. It was just, just it, a what? string, you know, rope, uh, yeah, maybe, the maybe, rope. maybe yeah. the string rope. Right. Peoria didn't even have that. And he said, now, listen, when things start to get rough in the ring, we'll give you a heads up. And, you know, we talked a little bit more and, and uh, he went about his business and I was roaming around the gym and I thought, I wonder what he meant by we'll give you a heads up if things are going to get rough in the ring. How would the ring announcer know that things are going to get rough in the ring? Now, at this point, at age 16, and it's kind of embarrassing to admit now, I was all in on the whole thing. I bought everything. Okay. I, I, I believed it was a real competition. I believed it was, you know, an athletic competition. And so I had no idea what I was about to learn. And sure enough, you know, my buddies, they, they, my buddies got a carload of guys and they drove up and they were sitting in the bleachers and we get ready to start and Ken gets in the ring and he's introducing the timekeeper. He's introducing the, the uh, physician at ringside. And then he says, and then from the peak in times, we have Mike Moore here tonight. You know, I stand up, I give a little wave to my buddies. They're hooting and hollering in the bleachers and things are, you know, I, 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 this is probably. Yeah. You're in heaven. I am uh, yeah, I'm in heaven at this point. Right. So, I mean, I am sitting on a metal chair with my elbows up on the ring mat. Okay. That's how close I am. And Ken had also told me when things got rough, what you do is stand up, take your chair and head directly backwards toward the front row. That was another instruction that I got. Okay. The very first match, which I'll never forget. You'll, you'll know who I'm talking about. Angelo King Kong Mosca versus Pedro Morales. In the opening bout. Jeez. Yeah, that was the opener. I don't, unfortunately, don't recall who the main event was. But uh, right. um, 
And as they started, you know, to read, they had the ring, uh, ring announce uh, in, introductions, and they 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 lock up, and they do a couple of things, this, that, and the other thing, and they lock up again, and I can hear them communicating with each, with each other as to what series of moves is coming up. Now, as a as a young budding journalist, my first thought was, "Oh my God." Wrestling's not real. I have the biggest scoop in the history of journalism. But as I continued to watch how things unfolded, I began I began to catch on. It, it, I, I must have been the only guy in the building who didn't know the fix was in, but I didn't. And now I did because I could hear and see up close what was going on and, and how it was uh, choreographed, for lack of a better term. And uh, so I'm a little depressed, sitting there kind of watching, kind of, you know, feeling sorry for myself that this wasn't what I thought it was. And all of a sudden, Mosca th throws Morales into the ropes, comes by and gives him a clothesline or an elbow or something, and Morales comes through the ropes and knocks me ass over tea kettle back and, and the timekeeper back into the front row. We're laying in the front row of the audience with Pedro Morales on top of me and then me on top of, of the first row of people. And my first thought was, oh, wait a minute, what's going on here? I didn't know anything. You know, I got no heads up that it was going to get difficult in the ring. I had no idea what was going on. And I thought, that kind of hurt a little bit. You know, I didn't, you know, Pedro's a big guy. I, uh, him landing on me was not all that fun. And, of course, the crowd is going nuts. They're slapping Pedro on the back and smacking me in the head and, and because they're excited. They, you know, they're not necessarily mad at me. They're just happy at the, with the action. Finally, Pedro gets up, goes back into the, uh, to the ring to finish out the match. And I'm, I'm left wondering, uh, you know, what, what's the whole deal? I ended up writing it as a straight story. I didn't have the scoop of the century, as, mm -hmm. as uh, everybody knew. Well, what do you mean by straight story? Let me let me let me just ask because um, did you just give results? Yeah, I mean, results. How, that's results. How you handle I'm it. sorry, okay. I didn't put a feature. I didn't put a feature together. I just I just wrote a results story. As an old newspaper man, I'm thinking that that's probably what your newspaper wanted anyway, right? That's exactly what they wanted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If I'd have if I'd have tried to gone any further with it, I think you know they would like you didn't well, walk into the sports editor and say hey i want to expose wrestling no, or, or no, get not into the nitty-gritty of it you just want no. to say i want to cover it yeah yeah oh, okay well, i knew i mean once i figured out what it was about then i you know i just wrote a result story so yes that was that mm -hmm. was it and i ended up doing um two other times with a media credential okay uh one of them, and this must have been, this had to have been in the winter of early 76, because the story we were told, a um, fellow by the name of um, Billy Francis, okay. who was a brother of Russ Francis, who at the time was the tight end for the, uh, I guess they were the were they Boston Patriots then, back in the 70s. Right, uh, the New England Patriots, but and Russ would re uh, wrestle in the off season, right. but Billy was a full time wrestler. He had won a battle royal to face Nick Bockwinkle for the championship in Peoria, and we were told that night that he wasn't going to make it to the arena because of a snowstorm somewhere, and his plane couldn't get off the ground. And it was right in the middle of when uh, Ray Stevens. Bockwinkle's longtime tag team partner and co-champion for many, many years there. They had done the angle where um, Stevens was doing a face turn. And I don't know if you've ever seen the video. Bill Apter is actually in this video. Okay. He was presenting their, their manager, Bobby Heenan, with a, a trophy for manager of the year in the AWA. And um, they didn't let Bill in on the angle that they were going to turn Stevens' face, and Bill barely got out of the ring before Stevens grabbed the trophy and and broke it on on Heenan's head and and uh, but anyway, this was right in the middle of all that feud. So they filled uh, Ray Stevens filled in for Billy Francis in the main event that evening in Peoria and actually won the title. Wow! In Peoria, which never we never had title changes in Peoria. Was it 
um, counted. I mean, you know, sometimes in the territories, if if it wasn't televised, they would do phantom title changes. But this was legit. No, it was not. Oh, okay. It was right. not. It was. It was. Stevens left the 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 ring with the belt and went into the locker room. Right. And I followed him in there, and in 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 the locker rooms in Peoria, there was two sets of locker rooms. It was it was convenient for the wrestling business because they could put the heels in one locker room and the and the faces in the other locker room. But in between the two locker rooms were uh, a shower that served both locker rooms and then the the bathroom facilities. So they were connected, but not directly connected to each other. But I followed Stevens in because I wanted to talk to him about winning the title for my article. And um, when I got in the locker room, he was he was just, you know, worn out. He was breathing heavy and he's sitting on, on one of the benches in front of the lockers with the belt, you know, on his leg. And Bobby Heenan came busting through the door of the other locker room. I want that belt back, Stevens. And he was using profanities and everything like that. Now, there's no way I've, I've thought about this for a long time, but there's no possible way that Heenan saw me where I was standing. I could see him keeping kayfabe, you know, if there if he thought there was a reporter around. But there's no way he saw me where I was standing when he came busting through. So I never knew, you know, what was what had happened, what had transpired. Was it not? Did it not go down the way it was supposed to? Was Stevens not supposed to take the championship that night? Um, and of course, when we got to uh, television taping the following Saturday, uh, the excuse or the, the 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 reasoning was that it wasn't a sank. It was supposed to be Billy Francis's match, and they, they couldn't so replace like, him. Yeah. So it ends do up you, being. A do you think what what Heenan did? Maybe he did see you, and he was kayfabing you. I suppose that's that's certainly possible. You know, and was, he may have come in, saw you there, and continued on with what he would have done outside. That you know, in seems the to be the most reasonable explanation. But you know, I was a 16 year old kid working for a local, you know, middle of nowhere paper. It, it, I, I I always wondered, you know, what I was, what but, whether what I was witnessing was. But you know what? Even in, even into the 90s, when I was covering matches, I would I would sometimes just have a photo pass. I would just take pictures. I wasn't there to interview anybody, and I know that all the wrestlers knew who I was and why I was there. They wanted. To, they want to know because they just don't want anybody interloping. Even into the nineties, they didn't want anybody. It was a too close, tight, too close. You know, it was definitely a close shot back then. So I, I would think the most reasonable explanation is that Heenan did see me, and did gave me. Yeah, up. it just kept going. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I, I know uh, I've seen Terry Funk continue in his character backstage for up to a half an hour after a match. Yeah. So it's like you know, when you're old school, you're old school, and you carry it around. You know, and the you, old you don't mess guys, with that stuff. They didn't like any. Uh, they didn't like any kids, and they didn't like any media in the locker room. No, they didn't. They did. They, that, they that's why. I, there. Um, you know, I got cursed out by Larry the X Henning one time. Mm -hmm. Larry was buck naked, yelling at me, "What are you doing in here, kid? Get out of here! You're not supposed to be in here." I'm with the media. No, I don't. I don't care. You're, you're done. Get out of here. Right, right. And when they do it, you go. I know. I know. <laughs> when a, a guy the size of Larry the X Henning, yeah, I was on my way pretty quickly. <laughs> hey, look, I got, I got, well, n nothing about me. Um, so anyway, let's move, let's move on from your early days. Where did you go as a writer after this? Tell me just in, in, in a very short tour who you've written for. I know you, you did a column for inside wrestling or the wrestler at one point. Part yeah, of the, uh, I did get a buy news from the wrestling capitals, right? That was, yeah, a, yeah. I did so get, you a, got a byline in a GC London publication. That's for yeah. sure. Which yeah. must have been a high water mark for you. It was at age. And uh, what seven. else? Have, what else have you done in that? Well, I, I did end up uh, getting a journalism degree from University of Iowa. Uh, I was also a baseball player while I was there, so um, I did get to to, to play a uh, Division One level, and then I got my degree. And I was a newspaper man for most of my career, forty years. Um, and I've written in Iowa, Illinois, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. I've worked in all four of those states. Um, I've been fortunate enough to be recognized for my work by all four states with their in their state press associations. Oh, I have one of those too. Yeah, um, New York yeah. State uh, Newspaper Publishers Association Award for sports writing for an interview with Mike Tyson, my friend. Yeah, and uh, congratulations! I yeah, uh, that, that, it was probably the high water mark of my whole career. Even though I went on to do great things after that, I mean, I was 
I was in the same category as like sports writers like George Feshi and stuff like that. And I was working for a small newspaper at that point. So I, yeah, I, was, was, I was like, boing, you know, it was great. Those awards are nice. I mean, at this stage of my career, I guess maybe I would have wished, I wished I would have made a little more money along the way rather yeah, than- Yeah, I know how you feel. Yeah, I know. Grab no. some awards, but- but uh, You know, it kind of validates your work though. It does. You know, and, and, it, and nobody could take it away from me and it's on your resume for the rest of your life. So it's not bad. <laughs> yeah. And then when I when I moved here to Pennsylvania in, in 2000, I became uh, executive editor of Montgomery Media, which is in suburban Philadelphia. And it was a group of um, 15 weekly newspapers in the small communities outside of Philadelphia and six monthly magazines. So I was in charge of uh, 21 publications for about a 10-year period. Um, and right after my stint there is when I actually uh, started writing books. I've written four books. Uh, about the making of memorable albums of the 1960s and the 1970s. They're called the Vinyl Dialogues. Uh, I had access to all of the 60s and 70s and 80s musical groups that came through Philadelphia because my publication would always do advanced stories on them. So uh, those interviews that I had with those stars, and, and you know, we're talking Hall and & Oates and Graham Nash and Art Garfunkel and, you know, right on down the line. Um, and so uh, there's four editions of that. And, and, and those were very uh, gratifying projects to do on the side. And then in recent years, I've uh, uh, transitioned to medical writing. And I actually work at a, in a university, uh, community, uh, university relations now, writing feature stories about alumni and, and uh, students and things like that. But during my time, and I'm, I'm going to circle back to our buddy after. Right. Now, and, and let me just explain something to our listeners here. This is funny. I didn't even realize this till we started taping. Mr. Morsher had no idea I worked with those two guys. No, I didn't. He does. He didn't know I was a PWI guy. No. So um, the fact that uh, all three of us are friends is kind of uh, unique in that regard. Is that he comes on the show? I don't even know why Craig told you that I'd be interested. Without introducing who yeah, I was, no, I, for, so I, it's like I, I, said was this, which is fine. It's a happy accident, as they yeah. said, right? <laughs> but when I was executive editor of Montgomery Media uh, in suburban Philadelphia, I was I was looking at resumes of people because I needed a an editor for a parenting magazine, and I was flipping through the resumes, and I came across a resume of Bill Apter, and on first glance. Of course, you know, I mean, 30, at that point, it was 30 years ago, I wanted to be Bill Apter. Now I'm looking at a resume and I'm wondering, is this the same Bill Apter? And as I read the resume, there, were, there weren't as many clues as you might think about his wrestling uh, background, which in hindsight is a little surprising because he has, has a tremendous career. Um, but I thought, you know what, I, I got to at least call this guy and see if this is the Bill Apter who I've always admired. And sure enough, it was. It was the Bill Apter. And I called him in for an interview and we chit chat and stuff like that. And if you read Bill's book, are you familiar with Bill's book? Um, I, I mentioned in Bill's book. Yes, I am. Yeah. Well, so am I for this <laughs> right. story. Right. We had, I interviewed him for this position for parenting editor and I ended up not hiring him. And, and he wrote about that in his book, uh, is, uh, is wrestling fixed? I didn't know it was broken. Right. And uh, but we became fast friends when we found out. You know, I mean, I just oh, oh, right. let me out. let me ask the other question. Why wasn't he hired? It was it was a situation that was a little beyond my control uh, from a corporate standpoint. They were getting ready to all right. eliminate the publication. Oh, all right. So you couldn't hire somebody for something that wasn't going to be there. Yeah. Right. Okay. They made me go through the motions essentially, knowing that. They were going to pull a plug on it. Oh, that's lame. And, and I would never put my, you know, who's yeah, you my dear never, friend now. I never put Bill after in that situation. No, you don't bring him in to, to cut him loose. That would right. be terrible. Yeah, right. I hear you. I told I hear him you. that. Yeah, I told As him. a newspaper guy, I think that's, yeah, okay, great. You're a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. I, I wouldn't put somebody that I loved in that position. Now, how, how did you hook up with Craig then? Is it through and Bill? Bill introduced or? me to Craig. Okay. And Craig Peters and I, you know, I, I, I think I probably was done reading the after mags by the time Craig came on board. I could be wrong about that. I was maybe early in Craig's uh, Craig, wrestling. Craig started in 81. 
okay, then I would have still been reading into probably the mid 80s. Right. So, uh, but I, for, for whatever reason, I didn't recognize his name, but Craig and I are great friends now. We do a lot of concerts together and he lives not too far from where I live and we see each other quite a bit and exchange uh, messages on Facebook. Uh, he's He's one of my go-to music guys too. So he is uh, Mr. Music in his old age. I'll tell yeah. you that right now. And it's fun. He, he, we have reconnected recently. He's been on the show a couple of times, and uh, every time we start to talk, it's 1989 again. It's yeah. amazing. You, you know, when you see an old friend, oh yeah, it, it's like the years wither off, and you look the same to each other, and nothing has changed. Nothing's changed. Right. Uh, I have had that experience many times, and I I Treasure. cherish those those. Me too. Okay, so now we're getting into the meat of why I wanted you on the show is because the AWA, yeah, the most underrated in the eyes of history, Federation of them all in my eyes, because they did so many good things for so long, and because of what's available on YouTube, as I always say, yeah, yeah, people think it's all Jake the Milkman Milliman and waving a chicken around his head or whatever it was at the end on ESPN, mm -hmm. but the, the the glorious AWA was something to behold. Every top wrestler went through there, including Hulk Hogan. Just explain what your connection was with them. Well, I, you know, I would watch them on TV. Uh, I would read the magazines and then uh, I believe they came monthly to the, to, to Peoria High School. Uh, that we would used to go. I know we went a lot. Every time they were in town, we went. And when I got to, to college um, and we traveled with the baseball team, every time we got into another city, first thing I would do is pick up the local newspaper, see if there's any wrestling any time when we were going to be there. And I was fortunate enough that my parents traveled uh, to a lot of the places we traveled to. So I had access to a car. Uh, when we were on the road, so I laugh because that was my deal too, man. Yeah, I, 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 because I, you know, I, I grew up in a small town called Catskill, New York. I didn't have a car. Yeah. I'd rely on my friend Rick Stickles with his beat up beige Volkswagen Beetle <laughs> to go to Big Town, Albany, thirty miles away to see the WWF at that point. So your story reminds me of mine. If I didn't have Rick, I wouldn't go. We'll yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so you know, I, I had access to wheels and and. Uh, you know, I could see other territories. If we were traveling in Oklahoma or Michigan or wherever we were, I could often see how, you know, one of the spring trips to Hawaii. And I actually went to Block Arena in Hawaii to see the matches um, while we were there. We were there for 10 days playing University of Hawaii. And uh, was uh, that, who, who's promoting that area? Do you that know? was, uh, Lord, was it Lord James Blears? That I, sounds right. You got it. You nailed I, it. It was Lord James Blears. You're, and, you're absolutely, you're right. I think. And the main event that night was Tor Kamada versus Harley Race. Wow. Chief Maivia was on the bill. And then there was a guy by the name of Ripper Collins. Ripper Collins was heavily promoted in Hawaii his whole career. Yeah. For some reason, he was a major star in Hawaii. Yeah, he must have lived there or had interest there. I don't know if he had an interest in the – but Ed Francis was also a promoter there, the, uh, the right. father of Billy right. and Ross Francis. Yeah, for a long time, the Francis is yeah. yeah. So, you know, I, I, I was able to, to to see some territories when I got a little older. But as a kid, I was, I was just absolutely fascinated by the whole theatrics of the thing. Um, I looked at it as art. Oh, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely art. You know, yes. it, it was – well, it's... you know, and, and, and the names, like you said, the names that came through there, when I first started noticing. Okay. Now I'm going to slow you down. Okay. Because I want you to re re just count for me and say out loud the number of great stars you have seen right off the top of your head. Cause it's always, this is what our listeners want to know. Who have you seen? Who have you been around? I mean, it, it's like. Let me start. I don't even know how, how many there are. Mm -hmm. But it started with superstar Billy Graham, who we just lost last week. It started with Graham. Wow. Yes. He was one of the first ones I can remember seeing on TV. People uh, forget his AWA background, too. Right. But it was it was right at the end of his AWA run before mm -hmm. he went to WWWF back then. Right. right. Um, but uh, as we talked earlier, uh, one of my favorite tag teams was Larry the Axe Henning and Big Joe LaDuke. Uh, Baron Von Raschke initially teamed with a fellow by the name of Horst Hoffman before he mm -hmm. hooked up with Mad Dog Vachon. Um, I even liked the guys, the jobbers. I loved George Scrap Iron Gadaski and Kenny the Sodbuster J. I mean, those guys never won on TV. 
but they were they were the backbone of of the television shows because they you know they always did the job for the guys they needed to put over. You know, it's funny. We just did a show about jobbers. You know what? Kenny J could go. If you put him in with a with a similarly sized opponent, he could be a good match. Yeah. You know? And everybody yeah. knew it too. He was very well respected in the business. But and and here's here's the end. You know, I was thinking about this earlier today. Vern had trained I can remember four guys that he trained. One was Kazro Vasiri, as we know, turned became the Iron Sheik. Uh, the other was a guy by the name of Paul Pershman, who became Playboy Buddy Rose. A fellow by the name of Dick Blood, or at least he went by Dick Blood at that time. He became Ricky Steamboat. Mm -hmm. I think that's his real name. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Um, and who was the fourth one? Rick Flair. Oh. Yeah, we were going to talk about Rick, Richard Flair. Yeah, Rick Flair. Who became beautifully Rick Flair. Yeah. Which, and, and which always amazes me because when he – the first time I ever heard of Ric Flair in the, the mid-70s, he was teaming with Rip Hawk. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought they found a young guy and gave him a name similar, Ric Flair, Rip Hawk. You know, it's bang, yeah. bang, bang, bang. That wasn't the case at all. Ric Flair was his, well, name. Right. Yeah. And, and, and think about this. You know, uh, when, you, when you mentioned superstar Billy Graham – Direct influence on a guy like Ric Flair at that oh, stage in their, yeah. in their careers. Direct influence. I can't think of any other wrestler as influential as, as Billy Graham. It, it's yeah. the number of people. Well, he changed the way heels did interviews, period. Yeah. Yeah. He did. I mean, you know, in the past, you'd have the Baron Von Raschke. He would be very German. You would, it was more of a, well, let's face it, wrestlers were heels because they came from someplace else a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Graham, right. what Graham was from here. He was just as he. Uh, I, I think was it was. Uh, I think Sonny Blaze just said on the show. He said he gave interviews like Muhammad Ali did. Yeah, he was all absolutely all about himself. Where was and, he billed as? It, was it Paradise Valley, Par Arizona? Paradise Valley, Arizona? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, Graham was all about himself. Uh, the ultimate braggart. It's like he was like, well, literally. Buddy Rogers on steroids, if you want to put it that way, yeah. you know, because because he blew up what Buddy Rogers did tenfold. Buddy Rogers was a great wrestler who was villainized for simply being confident. You know what I'm saying? Yep. It wasn't he was particularly dirty, although he played possum and other things of his era that people didn't like. But the the thing is, is that Rogers was simply arrogant, and people hated him for it. Yeah. So. Yeah. You take a guy like Billy Graham, he took what Rogers did and blew it up to unbelievable proportions. And he was really good at it, too. Right. But then Flair and Hogan and Jesse the Body, Ventura, all took what Graham did and took it to another level. You know, right now they're all saying it, too. They're just coming right out and saying, yeah. Are they? Yeah. 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 Um, which is wonderful. I think th <sighs> this is a huge loss. It I is. mean, it really is. This this um this year, him and to me, Jerry Jarrett, with you know, um when I heard that th that they're gone, I'm like, oh gosh, things are never gonna be the same. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So so what other great action uh, memories do you have from the Major High Major Flyers Major? were the with the main face team, Greg Gagne and Jim Brunzel. And by gosh, they didn't need any nicknames. They did not. Well, <laughs> well in the high flyers. Right. Uh, um, they were they were the main face team. I mean, it, it's hard to maybe explain to people how good Nick Bockwinkle and Bobby Heenan were. Oh yeah, from a promotional standpoint, um, Heenan was well, even back in the day before he became Monsoon's partner, before he did his WCW spent, uh, stint. You know, all the he not only was he great on the microphone, but he was a good in-ring worker. A lot of people forget that. Bobby Heenan was an excellent in-ring worker. Oh my gosh, yes. He took some huge bumps mm. and sold for everybody. Did anybody fly out of the ring better than Bobby Heenan? Nobody. 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 I mean, I, mean, I he did it well into Ultimate Warrior days when he had him dress up like a weasel. He, he could still fly out of the ring the same way, even though he wasn't working at that point. But, an but incredible wrestler. But the but, but the air of uh, intelligence that Bachwinkle gave off during his nobody else like him uh, his interviews was incredible to watch as a kid even as an adult it was incredible to watch but 
you know, during my time in the 80s, Billy Robinson, mm-hmm. um, who was always face from what I can remember in that era. But if you read, and you know this, if you read stuff about him, he, he, was, he was the real deal. He could beat you up and leave you broken on the side of the It'll road. Just stretch you like Stretch Armstrong, man. I'll yeah. tell you. It, yeah, uh, he was a tough guy. He was a legitimate he, tough guy. A legitimate tough guy. Um, but I, I want to segue back to Bachwinkle because it's like, okay. I, I remember watching ESPN with my mom visiting my mother around 89 when I started. And I'm watching the ESPN show and Bachwinkle's on. And she was, oh, he's he's an impressive guy. He means everything he says. She, it, people who didn't know wrestling would watch a Nick Bockwinkle interview and swear it was real. Yeah, every every word of it. Am Absolutely. I right or wrong? And yeah. and a tremendous in ring in ring worker. That's why oh, they put the belt gosh, on. Yeah. yeah, that's why they put the belt on him. He was he was a uh, he was a first class heel. He he was articulate. He worked hard in the ring, and and uh, he just put on a, a really good show. Um. Oh, and the tag team with Ray Stevens, my gosh. Well, and you know, when Stevens and when Stevens did his face turn, he actually started teaming with Pat Patterson in the AWA. Right. And they right. were a face team for a little while. Mm-hmm. Um and then you had the the mid card guys, Buck Rock and Roll Zoomoff, who turned out to not be a very nice well, guy. Uh, less about you know, I don't yeah. even want to mention his name, to be honest <laughs> with you. But no, he did he did make his mark. There's no question about that. Yeah. yeah. Um did you ever see the Vachans? I saw Mad Dog. I never saw Paul. Okay. Uh, Mad Dog was again highly entertaining. Uh, I also saw the Valiant Brothers, uh, right. handsome, handsome right. Jimmy and Luscious Johnny, <laughs> before the third Valiant Brother. I don't remember what his name was, but uh, oh, that was Gentleman Jerry, who Gentleman also Jerry. was was one of the Stompers and yeah. Guy Hill and a bunch of other names too. Yeah. But he, and, he he was he was actually. Uh, Better on the stick. They never let him talk in the East when he was here. And then he went to Indiana. He was a manager and he was really good. I yeah. mean, so I don't understand how, you know, they, they kind of kept him mute. You know why? Because he had, he had Jimmy Valiant, baby, you know. Yeah. And I don't even know why they brought in a third Valiant brother, to be honest with you. There's, there's a lot of conjecture as to why they did, but they did. And I'm not so sure that that wasn't the precursor to what, you know, the Freebirds stole a gimmick like that. Uh, although back then the Valiants never all wrestled at the same time. I don't recall any six man tag teams matches back. In the, maybe in the East, but, maybe, but, uh, but I remember one on TV, but that, you know, I, for some reason, Jimmy wasn't as active as the other two and I couldn't figure out why. You know, when he went up to, uh, work in Chicago for Bob Luce, when the Valiants were up there, they paired him with a, a manager by the name of Major Duke George. Right. And I'm not sure why they did, because I, I just didn't think the Valiants needed a manager, but, you know. Yeah, they sure had they, Albano in the East, too. They just, yeah. it's, it's, once, once the managers are there, they assign somebody to them. You know how it works? Yeah. 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 yeah but so the list goes on and on. As we, you know, as yeah. I mentioned to you earlier, Peoria was situated uh, uh, in, a, in an area where within three hours I could be in four different territories. Right. Uh, if we went north to Chicago, it was Bob Luce Wrestling. If we went uh, east to Indiana, it was the WWA and Dick the Bruiser. And then Bruiser would uh, would go to Chicago and appear. AWA had Rockford, Illinois, Peoria, Illinois, Moline, Illinois. And then Bruiser came back in to the central Illinois in Springfield, the state capital, and he had that. If you crossed over into Iowa, you were in the central states territory. And then if you went south to St. Louis, you were in Sam Muchnick's uh, Wrestling at the Chase, which was an NWA Central States combo uh, mm-hmm. type of project. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, if I'd have been able to drive and had money at the time, I'd go <laughs> to all those places. Oh, man. You know, I I never I, – I went to Madison Square Garden for the first time for wrestling. I think it was 77 – I was a, I was essentially an adult that I was just out of school, so mm-hmm. it was like it was like shoot, I missed Bruno and all the good stuff, you know. So I had well, Backlund. Then, Backlund was my era. Well, then um, the the loose promotion wrestled in the Chicago Amphitheater, which no longer exists. It was very much a Madison Square Garden type of thing, but it was near the stockyards in Chicago, big old barn of a place. 
and uh, and they they would draw. I mean, they yes. five, six, eight thousand people. Well, you know, Bob Luce was such a shy retiring guy. I mean, <laughs> right? I mean, he was very subtle in his. No, hell no. <laughs> For those who have never seen Bob Luce, oh, Bob they- would Bob could. Um, <laughs> Bob I, had glad, one I'm, I'll put it this way: I'm glad he never. He, I'm glad he never announced an asteroid heading toward the Earth because I think he would spontaneously combust before the asteroid hit. You know what I'm saying? He he was out there. Bob's Bob's main advertiser on the television show was Ben's Auto, and it, it was this cruddy little neighborhood auto joint that you knew probably wasn't on the up and up anyway. <laughs> and he would bring on he would bring on Moose Cholak, Yukon Moose Cholak, and he oh, and, and and Bob Luce, They would. They would sing a Ben song and just just be as goofy as you could possibly, have, but high again, highly entertaining, and that's what it was all about. That's what it was about. Yeah. Now, if you're AWA fandom, did you you grow into an adult, and you know we we meet people, we get married, these kind of things, and your life changes, and you kind of stray a little bit. But did you remain kind of loyal to the AWA throughout its tenure, or once it lost? Uh, the name guys that I grew up with, I kind of drifted to other promotions. I mean, I went to school in Iowa and that was central States. Uh, so I was, I was very much into the central States uh, from right. 77 to right. 83. And folks, I want to have Michael come back and do a central States show uh, very soon. We'll, we'll follow this up with central States because that deserves some play too. I yeah. Yeah. But, but um, yeah, once, uh, once all my favorites kind of went away, yeah, I I, I kind of quit following in the late '80s. I okay. picked up back again uh, for the Monday Night Wars. Right, I thought that was uh, fabulous entertainment. Okay, which leads us to Vern Gagne's AWA Championship Wrestling on ESPN. Okay. okay, to me, the most underrated wrestling program of all time. You had Kurt Henning, you had Nick Bockwinkel, yep. you had the Midnight Rockers, you had Larry Zbysko. Yep. On and on the list went. Um including a, a young Hulk Hogan. A young Hulk Hogan, right. Well, I no, he I think he had come and gone basically by the time that show came on. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. All this right. was post Hogan, but they had young Scott Hall. Yes. Who was yeah. tagging with Kurt Kurt Henning with for a Kurt while. Henning. Yeah. Larry the Axe, they had the Road Warriors. Yep. They had Steve Regal. They had uh, Jimmy Garvin with yep. Precious. So they had a lot of talent. And yet in the Wrestling Observer, it would be voted worst television program every year because they didn't have the flash and panache of WWE. And I'm like, why, guys? Do you really? Would you rather see the bully, the British Bulldogs with Matilda the Bulldog or the other cartoon stuff rather than the hard hitting AWA style wrestling? Um, I think what hurt the AWA, and they did this a lot, even in the ESPN years, is the Fluke finish. Yeah. Stanley Blackburn and all that would overrule yeah. something or, yeah. or say that the referee had been knocked out early, so the match was dead from that point. So yeah. you think there was a title change, but it was a swerve. Yeah. I think they went to that well far too often. You're pro- Yeah, I wouldn't disagree with that. Um, and Because you can burn out of territory. Ask Ed Farhat. Sure. You, know, you can burn out of territory. Yeah, and he did in Detroit, you know. Right. To right. Toronto too? Toronto, yeah. 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 So, uh, I, but I like the ESPN show. I like Larry Nelson. I thought he was, he was a homespun kind of a guy. He it was like, he was good at talking directly to the, I like Tron Trotgard, the old, the old school announcer. And, was, I liked, uh, and Ray Stevens would show up once in a while. And was, was, um, uh, Mean Gene and Ken Resnick. They were gone. No, Ken Resnick was there. Mean Gene was gone. Okay. Okay. Yeah, by that point, and, but they had, had Mick Karch, I think, a little for a little while, and uh, yeah. someone else whose name I can't remember who was very good. Um, but you know, that was Eric it, Bischoff late, it, late, late, late in the run. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Who, who because, knew what that was going to become? Right? Do you think it was because Vern just wasn't able to grasp what was going on in the business, and and just made some bad business decisions along the way? Well, Greg Gagne talks about it all the time, uh, yeah. even today. I, I think that Vern was – I don't want to say stuck in his ways because he'd emulate stuff the other – you know, he'd have his pay-per-views and his big shows in, in stadiums and whatnot. 
So, you know, he, he changed with the times in that regard. You know, he was promoting female wrestling long before the WWF was in a serious way. You know what? That's We didn't see um, female wrestling in Peoria. They never were on the card. Really? really? Yeah. In was the there 70s? any kind of a local statute that didn't allow it or something? I or? don't know. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't recall seeing the uh, the women. And you had to go to Chicago or St. Louis to see the uh, little people wrestle, the midgets. Right. right. And, and uh, so they never came to Peoria either. You know, maybe uh, that was rare. You know, I used to see matches in Albany, not New York City, in New York State. And Albany was definitely a B town. It was a small arena. You know, they they would draw up. They would fill it, but it wasn't big. So we never had this big special attractions often often either, uh, you know. And our our cars would be filled with a lot of jobbers, too, taking each other on. Well, I'll I'll say this: we we got the big names. We didn't have as many jobbers as you could, that as you might imagine that the place like Peoria might have. We had, you know, other than well, maybe how many? Eight, how many? You say it was a high school? How many did it hold? Oh, uh, fifteen hundred. Well, that's a lot. You know, that's that's pretty you know, good. And there was yeah. maybe between eight hundred and a thousand people there every time. It was pretty full. Yeah. They put, okay. Yeah, they put the metal ring right in the middle of the gymnasium floor, and they put you know. 10 rows of metal chairs and then pull down the bleachers. It was, it was full. It was a good crowd. I've seen a lot, you know, I've been in other high school gymnasiums that only had a hundred people in them. So. Right. No, me too. Yeah. All right. So go back. All right. You're, you're an eight every way guy or a Peoria guy. Yeah. What is your favorite moment that you ever saw with your own eyes? This is a good question, right? That is is a there a point. match or is, or is there a moment or a star that, you never forgot from when you were younger in that regard. That's an interesting question. I'm not sure I've ever given that a whole lot of deep thought. I, you know, because last week I remember seeing, I was talking about this. I did a show. The last show was a tribute to Billy Graham and I got to see him right after he had won the title in Albany. And I was shocked because it's a B town and he came out with it with the belt had been, I, I believe it had a new backing on the belt, like the belt, you know, the the, the, mm-hmm. the shield on the front was the traditional, but they put a different colored belt. Yeah. And it looked fabulous and he looked incredible. And the place was, the, the walls were coming off the place just well, from you, him standing there. You know what I remember was a huge deal at the time. You're gonna, you may have to help me with the details on this. Okay. But it was a closed circuit Ali fight. Yeah. Well, and, uh, com- and combination wrestling matches. Right. right. Now, did you guys have a local undercard for that? They actually put us in the Peoria gym, right? It's big screen, and they and then they and they they uh, fed it into that. To I mean, they sold it like it was a real live match, but we were watching on closed circuit. Right, right. But did you have a live undercard? No, we did not. You did not. Okay, we did not have a live undercard. Did All some right. places have that? Yeah, Shea Stadium. Oh yeah, yeah. Chuck Wepner versus Chuck Andre Wepner the Giant. Andre yeah. the Giant. <laughs> Classically <laughs> awful, you know. <laughs> but but um, yeah, but I I, that, being but a, that that could be a big memorable moment. Yeah, I understand that because that what got more hyped than that thing? Well, and it was uh, I think correct me if I'm wrong, but closed circuit was kind of a new thing, and this was kind of a a a, a venture the between wrestling and boxing and whoever else was involved. To to bring this to the people, um, you know. You know, still- what I, you know what I liked about the promotion for Anoki Ali, though, it was the one time in wrestling history, particularly in that period, where every organization banded together to promote it. Yeah, they were promoting it heavily in the East when they did an angle with uh, Gorilla Monsoon and Baron Mikel Cicluna. I remember in in the AWA they did a thing with Buddy Wolf. Yeah. Where yeah. I think he sparred with Ali on television and got the you know crap knocked out of him. Right. Do you know right. what I mean? But and I know that they didn't did it in other territories too in in advance of selling this this closed circuit event. And everybody worked in concert. I think it's the only time where they didn't argue about things. Yeah. Yeah. And I you know I, they must have made money. I, I it was it was hugely there was a bunch of buzz about it at the time. Oh, it made money. Yeah, we were you know we were saving our pennies to make sure we got a ticket of that. And it was it? You know, back then it was an expensive ticket. I want to say 
we might have paid $25 for that ticket. Oh, yeah, sure. It's like the Hagler Hearns boxing match. Everybody wanted yeah. to see it. Yeah. Um, the, the problem with the match was the match. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, exactly. Oh, um, God. Just watch. You know, and you know, was- do you know, do you know that Muhammad Ali, I think he got blood clots in his legs from Loki kicking him. He did. Which really did affect his boxing career later on. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I, you know, I mean, it looked real to me. So it was real. Yeah. So when the, but it was bad, you know, yeah. Yeah. It was, it was not entertaining. But when the story came out about, about him getting the blood clots, I, I, you know, I had no reason to believe that wasn't true. Cause no, he was, he was smacking him in the legs. I mean, over and over and over again. Now this went on for um, an ungodly amount of time. And, you know, you see, you see Anoki crawling like a spider trying to avoid, you know, the reach of Ali. And it just went on. It just, it wasn't entertaining. It was stoic. It was just, it was real. I don't know how they came about. They couldn't do a work. Neither one, neither one of them could lose face. You know, it was just, that was the problem. Their egos were so big, nobody could lose. You know who, who didn't come to Peoria? Okay. Conspicuous by his absence. Andre the Giant never came to Peoria. Okay. He would come to Des Moines in the central states. He would go to Springfield, Illinois for the WWA, but he never appeared in Peoria for the AWA that I saw. That's interesting. Yeah. I, um, I saw Andre in some smaller arenas. I saw him in the Mid-Hudson Civic Center in Poughkeepsie, teaming with Tony Atlas, taking on, I don't remember who. But that, that was not a big major. That was a practically a C venue. Yeah. So well, it's those, odd, odd that he wouldn't come to Peoria since it held that many people. One of those hundred person high school gymnasiums was where I first saw Andre live. I actually shook hands with him that night coming down to the ring, um, was in Springfield, Illinois, and there wasn't a hundred people in there and he was tag teaming with the bruiser. And I don't remember who they were, were going against that night, but, um, uh, but it was a WWA uh, promotion. So Mm -hmm. I'm not Mm -hmm. sure. I, I, again, you, you, you're going to know better than I did, but I mean, Andre did work for Vern, Occasionally, didn't he? Oh, sure he did, yeah. Yeah. But for some reason, he never made it to Peoria. Hmm, interesting. Here's a question I ask almost all the guests, because wrestling can be very um, surprising, florid, violent. Have you ever seen anything with your own eyes at an arena that made you go, I can't believe what I'm watching? I can't believe these guys are bleeding this bad or, or being this violent. Can you think of, a, of an event like that? I, I, I was going to say blading. Okay. When I first was exposed to that at a live event, um, it took me a while to figure out how it was happening because at the time, you know, the kids that were the, the 15 and 16 year old kids, the, the chatter among us was that it was fake blood and, you know, they, the wrestlers somehow applied it to themselves. And I always used to say, no, I don't think it's fake blood, but I just don't know how how they were doing it. and. I actually didn't figure that out until I was in college and, and in the Central States Territory. Uh, when I, uh, and I'll, I'll tell this story uh, again sometime. But you know, when uh, a wrestler got thrown out, I was in the front row, and I actually saw him reach into his trunks to get the blade, and I saw him do it. Uh, but I was two feet from him, and um, so that was always a little shocking to me that that they would go that far. For entertainment. Well, that's that's the thing. It is it's so far. I don't know, past the realm of bull- <sighs> common sense for an athlete to take a sharp object and make himself bleed, as opposed right. to it actually happening as an accident or somebody hitting him with something. You know, right. no one can believe that that they would do this. But you know, if you look late in his life at the Sheik or Dusty Rhodes or Bruiser Brody, and their foreheads look like mountains. Yeah. You know, it, it, you realize that, yeah, boy, oh, holy smokes. It's a hell of a way to make a living, we'll put it that way. Right? It is. And I, you know, I, you, we often heard the term growing up, you know, red means green. Yep. I assume they got paid extra if they bladed. Is that what that means? I think the answer to that is sometimes yeah and sometimes no. I think th- there have been times that I know of going back into the early 80s, you know, the stuff I was privy to, that if the wrestlers thought a match wasn't going over, one would go, let's, let's get this thing going. And they'd say, slam my head in the turnbuckle. And then next thing you know, he's, he's a mask of blood. 
But some guys didn't mind it that much. Yeah. You know, some guys I, did it as a matter of regular recourse. <laughs> it's just the, way, just the way the sport was in the late 70s, early 80s, you know. So I'm sure there have been times when, it, you know, either the promoter or the referee say, this is dying. All right, we'll get it going. And yeah. you would you go you, go to the juice. Yeah. It, but, it, you know, it, 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 it also, it, the one thing that does me, make me, I understand it after a while, the whole blading thing. But the the amount that some guys of blood that some guys lost is always. For, for, I, I've seen some matches where, well, Kerr Henning, on TV on ESPN against the Road Warriors, got his head tangled up in the ropes, and they smashed the tear over his head. But at one point, you could see through the entire crown of his head. I'm motioning across my baseball hat here, fans. You can't see me, but he bled as much as any human being ever. I mean, he was. He looked like he was bleeding out. It was ridiculous. So I don't know how they did that without, well, bleeding out, to be honest with you. Well, and I remember a television taping. Um, Mad Dog Vashon and oh, yeah. Reshke were the were the heels. And Crusher came out, and I think he beamed Mad Dog with the bell. Mm-hmm. And the blade job that Mad Dog did, uh, Roger Kent was the, Roger Kent, right. was the ringside announcer. And he actually sounded alarm. We need to get somebody out here to help him. Put some pressure on it. I think it's an yeah. artery cut. I saw the tape of that match. Yeah. yeah. I remember that as a kid and thinking, man, that's, that's you know, that scared me. But, yeah. you know, when you're a little kid and uh, guys like Bruiser Brody and Mad Dog Vashon and, and that type of ring presence, they're, they're frightening and that's what they're supposed to be. That's what they're trying to be. Yeah. See, I, this is another reason. I'll talk to you as another old time fan like I am. The philosophy of the censored match. I have never been able to equate whether they were censoring it because it was too violent to show on television to their affiliates, or if they thought if we hide this violence, they'll buy a ticket to come see it uncensored. You see what I mean? There's a philosophy behind the X on the screen or or, or not showing something that I have never been able to find a professional give me an answer on. Because they, you know, they stopped censoring a long time ago, right? But, you know what I'm saying? Even even into the '90s, they would put it. The, the Randy Savage snake bite, yes. When, when they showed it in yes. certain markets and stuff, they censored it because it was lurid. So I, I have never been able to equate whether it was like I said, they just thought people would be disturbed by it to the point where they would shut the TV off, or whether they thought, oh my God, look at this! I better get to the arena and buy a ticket because maybe I'll see this. I don't think it's the latter. I think it's the former, but I also think there might have been, for lack of a better term, corporate interests there. Right. I think the promoters were probably worried about maybe advertising fleeing if they thought it was too gory. Right, right, right. Yeah. And, you know, it, Dave, it's a famous story now about there is a scene in the Sheik's movie. Um, the story, excuse me, the movie about the Sheik I like to hurt people, where he's on TV, just torturing a guy in the ring with his, he's biting him in the forehead. He's stabbing him in the arm, all at the same. There's blood everywhere. And from what I understand in Brian Solomon's book that came out about Blood and Fire, called the you know the history of the Sheik, that affiliates were really upset with that television program. Yeah, it, it can happen. Jim yeah. Cornette tells a story about trying to get. Smoky Mountain Wrestling onto a local affiliate. And the guy who owned the station brings him into his office, puts a tape of the Sheik on and goes, that will never appear on my television program. Good day, sir. Yeah. I want, this is why I don't have professional wrestling on my, on my network. Yeah. So, so, you know, that can turn a lot of people off and that's the stuff that makes wrestling seem unsavory to some people. Yeah. And you know, it's a different world now. Maybe it would be more acceptable now, but certainly not then. Um, well, you know, second. I don't know if you ever watch AEW, but they're, they're juicing like, like, you know, ocean spray, you know, right. it's, it's like, right. <laughs> I don't know what to say. It's, it's just, it's like a polite greeting in AEW. I, I, it's, it's over the top at this point. By the way, just as a sidebar and you've read the book and I haven't. Right. How was the, the Sheik's, uh, fire gimmick? How did that work? Do what you do know you mean how it worked? I mean, how did he throw the fire? Oh, you what? don't know? No. It essentially, it essentially was flash paper. Okay. Or okay. fire pots, one or the other. Yeah. You light right. it and it, it goes up. But it yeah. has a very quick flash tendency, yeah. so it wouldn't really burn you. Okay. If you step right into it, it, it was turning into vapor by the time it got color. It was convincing. It certainly was. If it was done <laughs> right, it was fantastic. Are you kidding yeah. me? 
Yeah. But Lawler did it too. I mean, everybody picked up on that. Well, even but... Cornette did it once or twice, didn't he? Oh, Cornette did it a lot. Yeah. yeah. Ronnie Garvin, who's a famous yeah. TBS uh, angle. Yeah. Um, I, you can't overuse that stuff though. Yeah. And yeah. That's, that's, that was the problem with poor Ed Farhat. He never knew when to shut it off and he burned out two major cities yeah. for a long time. Those cities took a long time to recover. Yeah. Um, again, it was great. But you got to know how to temper it. And yeah, I, I often wondered if Abdullah the Butcher, who also wrestled in the AWA, I wonder if he turned off more people than he sold tickets. Uh, he was so extreme and so question. violent that I think that maybe he repelled ticket buyers rather than attracting them. I don't know. I mean, maybe we're underestimating the bloodlust of the American public. Even well, that's back. a good point. You're right. You know, um, you know, I. I'll be honest with you. As a kid, if I went home that night and somebody had juiced, I was happier than if I didn't see blood. Really? Yeah. But I, I, mean, I remember being 11 or 12 years old and seeing Fred blasting Noah up and a guy's head on, on TV and feeling very disturbed. Yeah. But here's the thing about wrestling. I can't believe what I watched. I remember after watching Blassie, I was outside playing with a basketball. And I was like, oh, God, that was that was horrible. I can't wait to see this next week. Yeah. yeah. What is it about wrestling? Yeah. Right? Oh, my. That poor, and I think poor it wasn't so much, Why do I want to go and watch it again? It wasn't so much that I think I isolated on the blood. I, th I think it was part of the total package of right. the presentation. Right. Um, Despite what the wrestling magazines were presenting around 75 through about 85, when you would think it was nothing but guys stabbing each other all for, you know, and they overdid it. Even the London magazines did. I'll be the first to admit it. You, you, they were juice covers. Like I remember, I was working in a drugstore as a 16 year old kid. Right. We had a big magazine rack and there's a lady shopping and she's passing <laughs> this is around 76, 77. She's passing the newsstand and there on the front, somebody left. I think it was a wrestling superstars cover with Dusty Rhodes gnawing on the forehead of King Curtis and his blood oh. everywhere. And she's going, would you take that, take that away? I don't want to see that. Yeah. I'm not surprised. I mean, that era that there were certain things that uh, a segment of the population thought was obscene or mm -hmm. unsavory or, right. you know, and th those were not the fans that were buying wrestling tickets. No, or the magazines. Or the magazines, right. Right, right. yeah. I, but I will say this, that I know that from London's, uh, who I work for, I think by the early 80s, I think they were read the riot act by the distributors. They said, if you don't stop it with this, we may have to just consider not carrying your product because we're getting complaints. Oh, some of the, and some of the lesser magazines, like those Canadian ones and some other things, they didn't know how to shut it off. They were just blood, 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 blood on the covers. Yeah. So, you know, it it was, you know, you know like you say, red turns to green, but. Yeah. At what you know, cost sometimes? You know who uh, we haven't talked about in the AWA? Uh, Ken Patera. Oh, heck. Mr. Saito. Mm -hmm. um, and who else did I just think of um, from that general time frame? Um, yeah, uh, it, uh, it escapes me now, but um, we're talking eighty-five ish. Yeah. Oh, uh, Crusher Blackwell. Crusher Blackwell. Yeah. He actually Crusher. had a good, pretty good AWA run. He did. He was equally as effective as a heel or a face. Yes, he was. He, he was. could do anything they needed, and you know what? Very underrated. Uh, oh, he's just a big fat guy. Now he was way better than that. He could he, drop he kick was, when he was young. He actually, yeah, he could. He was, he was, he was athletic for a big, uh, uh, a big round guy. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. And you would never dream he could. I know he sold tickets in the East Coast when he drop kicked on TV. Everybody went, whoa. Yeah. And I know in the East Coast, people went to see him throw a drop kick, which invariably you wouldn't do when you paid to see the. <laughs> I, yeah. I went to see him in Albany once. Oh, let's throw the drop kick. He didn't do it, but um, you know what? The, the magazines. Uh, I believe at the time I was able to figure this out. I was a little older, but when um, when Sheik Adnan Al KC appeared in the AWA, I knew that was Billy White Wolf from the WWWF right. from the magazines. I, I recognized him from the magazine. Well, it was the same face, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that I happened mean, a couple of times. Uh, I can remember 
coming home, uh, I, I, it was the first year I was involved in the Central States, and I came home to Peoria for Christmas break. And I had just seen a match out in Des Moines, and there was a big Russian by the name of Alexei Smirnov. And when I got wow. home, the next month, when I got home to watch the AWA show, he appeared as Cecil Dubois, a Frenchman, uh, for the AWA. And I thought, well, that's that's pretty close together. He must have just left one territory and gone to the AWA. And I don't think he lasted very long there. There there are wrestler juxtapositions I'll never understand. I mean, was it Larry Hymini or was it Lars Anderson, which was real? Right, right. <laughs> it obviously was Larry Hymini because nobody could pronounce his last name. Right. So and he that's became how I Lars Anderson at one point, yeah. Right. I knew him as yeah. Did you know him as high? Boy, was he a tough guy. Holy smoke. Yeah. Another AD, he worked AWA for a while, right? He did, as I as I Nimi, I think. Yeah. Boy, yeah. you're a legitimate tough man. Holy he smoke. He was. So was Buddy but Wolf. It, we mentioned it, Buddy Wolf earlier, but he Buddy was a, Wolf was rough, tough, yeah. Yeah. Very underrated. There's some guys that people don't think about anymore that were really good in their day, you know? Yeah. Angel Moscow, you mentioned to me. I don't know if it was here or off air, but yeah. good gosh. You know, a yeah. human human battering ram he was. He was, and he he worked stiff too. By the way, I think <laughs> not a lot of guys liked working with him. Really, I don't think so. I got the impression, just you know, bits and pieces, uh, along the along the years, he was a tough guy to to he, work with. He's tied for me with Sweet Hansen as the most realistic backbreaker I ever saw. Over the knee, and they'd yeah. be sneering and laughing as they did it, holding the chin down, you know, so they couldn't move. Yeah. Ooh. Blood curdling, you know. Ooh, who's got the best pile driver? The ever pile saw? driver. We were just talking about another show. Um, I think Lawler gets to Duke only because of the Kaufman thing, and he yeah. kind of made it famous from that because yeah. he did it twice, sure. and it made the national news. If you remember at the time when he did it. Mm-hmm. There, uh, though Paul Orndorff used to do that little like like uh, we had a we had a guest on the show. Um, we were talking about pile drivers. Um, Liam Savage from Canada, he said he liked the way that Orndorff would kind of do a little jump up before he came down. Yeah, and yeah. that was pretty unique. There was a lot of oh Har- Harley Race had a great pile he driver. Did. Um, he Ray did. Stevens had a great pile driver. Yeah, Nick Bockwinkle would pile drive a guy once in a while. I mean, mm-hmm. so you know you know what ones I like the ones that look real. Yeah. Because if you ever see a guy botch one or make it look, or if his head is too far up between, some guys wouldn't even bother to put the head between the legs. They kind of put right. it over the legs. Right. And then hope that you didn't see them from different yeah. angles. Those are the lousy pile drivers. Yeah. Right? The ones between the legs were, were the were the real ones because you couldn't see whether the head actually hit the mat or not. Right. Right. And you just assumed it. Yeah. Pile drivers were best on guys with a lot of hair because you don't know if it was the head or the hair. Yeah. <laughs> and if you saw the hair, you'd assume it's the head. <laughs> So, uh, yeah. Uh, by the do way, you, we were talking about, uh, do you have a favorite wrestling maneuver? Because on a, on a previous show, which you probably didn't hear, <laughs> we were talking about our favorite maneuvers of all time. Do you have a maneuver, a single move that, done by a wrestler that you find to be your favorite? Because I do. I definitely have one. I think you'll agree with me when I tell you about it. Well, I, I'll probably agree with you, but I'm going to surprise you maybe. Okay. And it's only because I have a personal story attached to it. I always thought the Baron Von Raschke claw was highly entertaining. Okay. Yeah. It was highly. He sold it. He sold it with every fiber of his body. That's right. You know, uh, Furpo's El Gorfio was not as convincing. Uh, The Von Erichs had uh, a nice, one of the Von Erichs had a nice claw, David, maybe. Yes. Uh, And Fritz, the old man, did the claw hole. Mm -hmm. But uh, Raschke's always, you know, the little little goose step that he did before he, you know, gave you one of these. Yeah. And before he applied it, I always thought his was very credible. I always enjoyed that entertaining aspect of that. I used to like Von Raschke would hold his hand and kind of stare at an interview. It's like it was a disembodied thing, you know, like the yeah. claw. Like it's like it's coming from somewhere else. I could not control the claw. He was such a good interview. He really was. But here's my favorite maneuver. It's simple. I, I don't want to overdo this because I talked about it in a different show. Harley Race's slow motion knee drop. Yes. Because it, it looked real. It, it to, did this, look. to this day, I can't figure out how he did it without smashing the guy's head in. Because or you didn't see, <laughs> yes, you didn't see anything except the knee hitting the head. It was incredible. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of, I've seen a lot of knee drops, none better than his. Holy smokes. I'd forgotten about that. I saw a lot of those uh, in the NWA, yeah. Well, you know, I know what he talks about. It wasn't a finisher. It was right. just something he did. Right. 
but everything he did looked real. You know, and that was the beauty part about the old timers. You know, Larry Henning too was another one. He used to tag. They used to tag together, and they people hated their guts because every they looked they were killing everybody they were in the ring with. Well, yeah, they were they were heels in the sixties, I think. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So that's a, that's good stuff. Pretty that's, boy, Larry Henning, I think, right? Yeah, or a handsome Harley race at that point. Yeah. Handsome Harley. Yeah. Handsome Harley. <laughs> hey, you know what? I'm having a blast. Uh, if it wasn't for the fact that I got to keep these shows succinct, I'd talk to you another two hours. But um, yeah, We'll do another one on Central States. We're going to do one on the Central States very soon. How's that? Because yeah. I, I know there's I, I get questions to do different territories. And you've seen enough of the AWA. Um, do you miss those days like I do? Absolutely. No question about it. It was, it was the form of entertainment that... Uh, that I have nothing but fond memories about. Uh, and it's not just the in-ring action. It was the whole, the whole total package. It was the, my buddies that were with me. It was, you know, grabbing a sandwich after the matches. It was watching them, you know, sweep up the popcorn. It was the whole thing. Yeah. The, the buildup when you got there, waiting for that first opening bout. You know, uh, you, you, just, you just triggered a thought in my mind. I liked wrestling better when it wasn't for everybody. Yeah. Like you wouldn't let your little kids watch wrestling. Now they're dying to get, you know, that's a good point. And Tina. They have made it so there is such a big production and they want everybody to watch it. I liked it better when it was almost like this little secret thing that you and your pals would would enjoy. Yeah. You wouldn't go to school and say, hey, we're big wrestling fans and you wouldn't wear a t-shirt, but you all knew your friends that liked wrestling and you would all scheme to get your tickets and go. Exactly. Because that was that secret little thing you guys all liked. Well, and we did. And it was safer. It was safer than Playboy. You know, if you told your parents I'm going to wrestling, that's fine. If you told them I want to go buy a Playboy, you'd go. You know, you're not. You know, exactly. Right. That's the year we grew up in. Right. Yeah. We we were we were at the age where we had just started driving, and one of my buddies' dad had a station wagon. We'd get eight guys in a station wagon, and away we go. You know. Exactly. It's the same with same story with me. And that's why I'm, I'm so drawn to you is because I had that same group of pals. Yeah. You know, and one of us drived, you know, one of us had a car. Yeah. So if Rick, my buddy Rick, God bless his soul, um, if he um if he was available and wanted to go, Rick Stickles and I, I walked to another county to buy wrestling tickets. <laughs> Not just up the road. We walked yeah. about, I'd say, 18 miles each way <laughs> into the next county. How about the car was in the shop, <laughs> but we wanted to get the advanced tickets at the Hudson High School in yep. Columbia County, New York. We walked. Oh my God, it was a long walk, and we didn't even it didn't even phase us. No, we wanted to see those matches. Dean yep. Ho against Bobby Duncan, <laughs> Big Bad Bob Duncan. Yeah, and the Bullet that was Jacks. the main event. They were AWA guys, Blackjack Lanza, Blackjack Mulligan. Right, sure. sure. Oh, that's just the, countless guys. They were in Heenan Stable, so yes. yeah. Oh, they were great with Heenan. Yeah, yeah. There's still a lot of great videotape. Thanks to Dave Dynasty, who's going to be on our next show. Good. He, he put sure out, he, tune in, tune in on, on YouTube, look up his name and look at his videotape library. He has a lot of Indianapolis and Bobby Heenan in his prime and it's glorious. So I'm having Dave on in our next show to thank him profusely for finding this stuff and putting it on the airwaves because it's like, I'd rather watch it than the stuff that's out now. I'm sorry to say it. Yeah. I you know, know, I'm with but, you on that, man. But this is why this is the outdated wrestling arm. And you know what? I may be outdated, but I'm not dead, and I like what I like. <laughs> oh, there you go, man. Right. <laughs> this is Mike Morris. He's a, he's a writer and a journalist. And if he came on this show strictly from the, the recommendation of my friend Craig Peters, and I want to thank Craig for bringing Mike to my attention, because I think we just made a new friend here. Yeah. And we're going to have you back. How's that sound? That sounds great, Bob. I enjoyed myself. Thanks a lot. I, I did too. I, immensely. I needed this. You know, with all the bad news of the last 10 days or so, it was fun to look back at the stuff we really enjoyed. As I've kids. been looking forward to it ever since you contacted me. So oh, I appreciate great, it. Man. All right, man. Folks, it's Mike Moore. Oh, is there any way people can find you on social media or anything? Like yeah. That? Uh, the Vinyl Dialogues has a Facebook page and a Twitter. Uh, and then uh, Mike Moore at, uh, at Facebook. Uh, and uh, I don't have a, a personal Twitter account, just my, just for my books, but, uh, the website is, uh, www.vinyldialogues.com. I'm going to check that out too. I'm a music guy myself. So, yeah. you know, I was on the, I was on the road for 15 years with the blues. You said band. that. Would, uh, yeah. Yeah. Performed with Baby King, Tenta. I did. I was a singer. Oh, 
Yeah. Nice. You, if you can believe it. Um, what man? Way to go. So, I'm so decrepit now, but, uh, oh no, I, I, I had some real high watermark. I was in the house of blues radio hour with, with Dan nice. Aykroyd. I was, um, 10 times on stage with BB King. Um, we did it for real, man. Yeah. It was yeah. real. It wasn't demos, baby. It was the real deal. So well, how do we do that? I'm proud of that, that a little. Then my name was Robert Charles, but it was spelled C H A R E L S because there was a Bobby Charles. Uh, I didn't want to be confused with the other guy. Yeah. So I changed yeah. Bobby to Robert and Charles to E L S. And Charles was my dad's name. So, you know, yeah. Yeah. but I needed a name and uh, we did our thing. We're on Amazon and Spotify. If you ever want to listen, it's free. The real historian of wrestling, Mr. Michael Morse. What fun, man. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. I am certainly hoping that you guys had as much fun as Michael and I did talking about the old days, like we always do here in the Outdated Wrestling Hour. It's amazing when how you meet another person you've never met before, and you start to talk, and you felt like you know him for 30 years, and Michael and I were just talking off uh, off the air here about that's how we felt after the conversation was over. Because you know what? We all have that shared community sense of being younger, thinking the wrestling matches were important, loving what we're seeing, and going to the cards and watching the television. And if you're really super duper lucky, like I've gotten and like Michael got, we get to write about it every now and again and get involved in that world. A world that seems to be kind of over now, but I still have hope. You know, I hope that wrestling becomes what it once was once again. And it doesn't mean it has to go all the way back. Just give me my suspension of disbelief, man. You know what I'm saying? Well, anyway, that's another wrap on another outdated wrestling hour. We hope you enjoyed this look back at the stars of the AWA and those those times in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. We had a blast. My name is now Bob Smith on Facebook. I was Robert Smith before. I have changed it to Bob Smith. It just makes sense since I'm doing this now to be me. <laughs> Our website for the outdated wrestling hour is outdatedwrestlinghour.buzzsprout.com. If you don't want to download an app to listen to the show, just uh, get the website up, pick the episode you want, and take a listen. They're all right there for your listening pleasure. Our opening and closing theme is Hold On a Sec by a fine guitarist named Brian Teo. Thanks again, Brian. Wonderful work. We're also at Twitter. I'm Bob Smith NYC. Real simple stuff. And we have more guests coming next week. Uh, we're hoping to have Dave Dynasty here to talk about what he's been up to lately. And for me to profusely thank him for making YouTube my favorite TV station. Do you know what I'm saying? I watch YouTube all the time for the classic old matches and who's more prolific and bringing them to us than the, the dynamic nostalgic Dave Dynasty. So I'm hoping he's on next week. If he's not, he'll be on soon. So that's it for now. I hope you had a lot of fun going back to AWA with me. So let's, uh, End the show with a quote from a legendary Vern Gagne himself who once looked at the camera and said, This is wrestling. wrestling.